Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining our THLA interactive webinar series. This is our second of three interactive webinars. Um, thank you for taking time out of your day to come and hear a very, very special and intelligent and influential speaker of ours. Um, as you all may know, uh, THLA short course is offered once a year, usually the first week of January. Uh, but given COVID and the safety of our speakers, our guests, and, and our participants, uh, THLA decided to host three interactive webinars for all members uh, of the association completely free. And the way we narrowed down on who should speak and what topics we should speak on is we looked at our historical five-year trend from the in-person short course, and we looked at which speakers were highly top rated and which ones had the best topics. And so from there, we were able to funnel in onto three different categories and then three different top speakers. And so you truly are gonna hear from one of the best of the best in the industry. She's gonna give you some amazing insight. And Karen McCullough um, is a speaker and author, a branding expert. She's worked with a lot of top uh, national brands. Procter & Gamble actually says that Karen has become the standard by which they compare all their other speakers to. Um, and she's gonna teach you all and explain to you all a lot of the essential skills that you all need to manage, motivate your team and yourself and, and keep going during this uh, you know, pivotal time that we're all in. And the best thing about, I think, her approach and every year that she comes to short course is her message is always practical and relevant and you know, she's a very fun person. And so without further ado, I'll pass it to Karen uh, to take it away, Karen. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm coming to you from Houston, Texas, where it's raining again. Um, I really, when they asked me if I would present, I was excited uh, because I've done, I think, 12. I think I've done 12 short courses every January. I start my year with you, so I can't wait. I just can't wait to get back with you. Um, so today we're going to be working together I'm going to be uh, speaking on going beyond the brand for personal leaders. I love talking about branding. It's my favorite, favorite subject. And I love the short course. So first of all, I want to welcome you all. You know, I know this is a little bit of an old song, but I just feel like it's time for welcome a hug. Welcome so back. Give you a hug. We're your dreams were your ticket we're going to talk about we're going to talk about your brand. Um, yeah, when the pandemic hit, it really changed. It changed most of our lives for at least 18 months. I know that um, there have been so many changes that are going on right now. And I've been thinking about you guys. I think about you all the time because I miss you. You were my mainstay. Um, you were everything to me because that's me. That's what I used to do uh, 18 months ago. Um, I was live on stage and the biggest change that I had to make, the biggest change was speaking to no one, speaking to my little Logitech Brio or speaking in my living room and doing pre-recorded. So we've all been through changes and we're all adapting and we're coming out on the other end, which is really, really exciting. The one thing that I learned from what I've been through this last really you know, 16, 17 months, however long it's been, is that I always speak on change and I've loved talking about change, but I realized that most of us don't really change until we have to. Um, and right now, many, many of us are being put in situations where we all um, are faced with change and we're all having to change. So the cool part about it for me is that I actually get to work with my assistant, Jonna. Jonna, say hi to everybody. Hey everybody, it's so nice to meet you all. I like to come and be with Karen on these. It's always fun. Yeah, John has been my assistant for as long as I've been speaking to you guys. And um, so we're talking about a decade or more. And um, I've really only seen her now because we she lives in Mexico. So there have been some really positive things that have happened with this. So John is going to help me today. Sometimes you're going to be putting answers in the chat. And um, she's going to help me. She's going to tell me some of the things that you're saying, because I will be pretty much looking at my screen. So the first thing I'm going to ask you, it's a question. Whoops, sorry. Um, I'm going to ask you on the change scale. We're talking about change right now. I want you to rate yourself one, two, three, four, five. One, 
be honest. You know what? I'm not really good with change. I'm not going to know you. We're not going to see you. So you can put an honest answer in there or maybe two. Right now, you're a little bit confused. You're not quite sure what your role is. Maybe number three, you're just upset. Why change? Things worked so well. Let's just go back to the way things were back in February of 2020. You know, why change? Uh, number four, I'm pretty frustrated with change right now. The changes that are going on, there's so many. And I feel a little bit of frustration. Or five, right now you're feeling pretty okay with change and you're anxious maybe to, uh, to see what other changes are coming about. So put your answers in the chat. And John, you can kind of tell me what's going on. Any? Looks like we have quite a few people that are okay with change. They're okay. We've got a lot of fives in there. We've that, got a lot of fives in there. Yeah. That is really good. And, and you know, that's good to hear because we're on, we're on the, uh, the last cycle of the changes. So that's really good. Maybe if I'd asked you right in the very beginning, we'd all be, we'd all be a little bit confused, but that's I like this answer, a three and a five. I embrace, embrace change, but not unless it's going to make a difference. Okay, good. <laughs> of course. Right. Yeah. They say that, um, all good comes from change, but not all change is good. I've, I've heard that one. As a motivational speaker, we, we hear all of these things. So today, I'm going to talk a lot about brand because I think this right now is a fabulous opportunity. Companies are rebranding. Um, so we'll talk about that identity of your organization and the branding that they're going through. And then we're going to go a little bit deeper and we're going to talk about you because this is a time for all of us to maybe have a fresh start. And maybe to um, rebrand or take part of the brand that we already have and maybe enhance it. So today I'm going to be talking about branding, the company brand, and then I'm going to go into your personal brand. I love branding. I've got to be really honest with you. So I've got to take you back. This is my history. Before becoming a speaker, um, I had four preppy, we called them preppy back then, clothing stores here in Houston, Texas. And I carried a line called Ralph Lauren. I put Ralph's picture, Ralph's down there at the bottom. Now, Ralph, he's a pretty uh, high-end product. You, a polo shirt cost, cost more than regular polo shirts. I mean, he, he was really proud of his brand and he showed it in his prices. Um, but in order to carry that product, we had to be screened, we had to be scoped out, and we had to really live the Ralph Lauren brand in order to carry it. So way back, I opened my first store in 1982, right? And uh, so every year as I carried more and more polo and the brand, I became more like a Ralph Lauren store. And I learned that we live the brand and he has special ways, the way we wrap the packages, the way we greeted the customer, um, the way we had our store set up, all had to feel and fall into the brand. Just as your organizations, your hotels, your services have to fall into the brand of the company, we had to do that with Ralph. And then um, in 2000, I did my first keynote speech. I decided to become a speaker back in, the, in 1998, 1999. And it was really interesting because right as I was deciding to become a speaker, a guy named Tom Peters, he's right there in the slide. Tom Peters uh, came up with this whole concept that each of us has a brand and that we can grow our careers if we enhance and grow our brands. And he came up with this whole concept of a brand called you. I was fascinated with this. This is what I wanted to speak on. And so when I first started speaking in 2000, that's what I spoke on. But nobody understood branding back then. Personal branding was not really something that people, that especially companies wanted their employees to do. And so it kind of went dormant until millennials came on the scene. So when millennials, when you all came into the workplace, you realized the power of a personal brand and you really kind of re-engaged this whole idea of a brand called you. That was about 10 years ago. Right now, today, after post-COVID, it's really important again. So that's what we're gonna talk about. But first, I'm gonna take you back. It's gonna be like a little bit of a college course on branding. I want you to begin to understand how brands first came about in this whole idea of branding. So I call it branding 101. And the key word here, back in the day, because I'm gonna take you all the way back to the 60s, back in the 1960s, we 
really differentiated brands with what we call the differentiator. So it was how my company is different from your company, how my hotel might be different from your hotel. And the whole big concept in the very, very beginning of branding was called differentiation. And differentiation, a good example of it I will give you is with the discount stores. They came on the scene way back in the, in the late 60s. And the first one on the scene was Kmart. And when Kmart came on the scene, it said, you know what, we're going to have a store, and this was a brand new concept, that is going to be this huge box, and it's going to be out in the suburbs, and we're going to put everything in this store, from tires for your car to baby food. We're going to have it all in one big place, and it's going to be cheap. It's going to be cheaper than anywhere else. We're going to try to keep our prices down. And their differentiator back then, if any of you remember Kmart, was called the Blue Light Special. Now, if I was saying this right now in a short course class, if we were sitting in Houston and we were at in the room, in the big room, and we were talking, there would be a few people in that room that would know the Blue Light Special. They would be the baby boomers, right? They would be nodding and they would be, and nobody else knew. But the Blue Light Special was their differentiator. And it said, when you're in our store, Come in every day because we're going to mark things down and you can get a terrific deal if you're shopping in the store. So their whole idea was to get you into the store and every day they would mark something down and it would be the blue light special. And that went on for a few years until Walmart came on the scene. And Walmart's differentiator, Sam Walton, wanted his biggest differentiator to be, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Hold on. Everything would be made in America. Yeah, that was his differentiator back in 1965, 1966. Yeah, he'd be rolling over right now. I'm sure he is in his grave looking at what, what they're doing in China. But anyway, that's beside the point. Walmart was going to be very pro-America, was going to be very, very pro-people. They were going to have greeters. And his whole idea was to be the heart and soul of America. And he was going to put his stores in the beginning in small towns where, uh, in, where other cities would feed into these towns and he would grow them from the inside out. That was his expression. A few years later, in the late 60s, early 70s, Target came on the scene. And Target's differentiator was going to be fashion. They were going to be cool. They were going to, they started with a line called Morona Sport, and they were going to really focus on women and fashion. And then they made the decision to even increase that to everything that is current. And they were going to be selling to a lifestyle. So if we were going to say what their differentiator is, I would say that they're cool. And I would always ask my audience, does anybody want to go to Target after my talk today, even if you don't have anything to buy? And when all the hands go up, I'd say, look at all the cool kids in here. Because Target's lived up to that brand, that differentiator, and it continues, continues to bring in new ideas and uh, be especially for the cool kids. So that was the first, that was the first in Branding 101. It was called the differentiator. So you can be thinking right now, what differentiates your organization? What differentiates your hotel? What dif differentiates your food services? What differentiates your company from the competition? And that's really the foundation in the beginning of branding. But it goes a little bit deeper. Branding 102, it has to start with Coke. So now let's move into the 1980s, where the CEO of Coca-Cola was obsessed with Pepsi. And Pepsi came out with the Pepsi challenge. And it was really interesting because if you watched any of the shows on TV, people would say that uh, they would have their cart full of Coke. They would say that they enjoyed Pepsi, but then they would give them two drinks to drink blindfolded. And every time they would have Pepsi on one hand and Coke on the other, and they would pick Coke. And it was very, very interesting because, I mean, they would pick, excuse me, they would pick Pepsi, but they had Coke in their carts. So Pepsi won the Pepsi challenge, but Coke, was what they were buying. And this is interesting because the CEO, even though people were buying the Coke, he decided to change the formula of Coke. He decided to change it to taste like Pepsi. And all of you know what happened with that. Yeah, people started hoarding their Coke, right? We, we didn't want to get rid of our Coke. And he came out with a product called New Coke uh, that lasted about two weeks. <laughs> Today, you know, we're, we're in 2021. People are still worried they're going to change the formula of Coke and they're going to mess it up. So the second piece of branding was if you have something that works, don't get rid of it. We have to really look at what's working and we have to keep enhancing what's working, but we have to listen 
to our customers. And what they want, we deliver. And if they like what we're doing, we keep doing it. We don't, we don't change, just like with Coke, we don't change the flavor of Coke. After Coke came Starbucks. Starbucks raised the bar. Starbucks said, we're gonna be consistent. We're going to have the same products, he said. But what we're going to do is we are going to give people an experience. So when you walk into our stores, you're going to want to come in and talk to our barista. There's going to be energy going on. You're going to smell the coffee. So yes, our differentiator is going to be that our coffee costs more than anybody else's. It's going to be expensive, but you're going to love it so much because it's going to be the same quality every time. And we're going to give you an experience. So now branding is getting a little bit deeper. And now we are going into the customer and what the customer feels and how the customer feels and the experience, the experience of walking into your hotel, the experience of the people, the people at the front desk. So it's more than just a service. It's now become an experience. And then Apple came along. And Apple said, we're going to give you all that. We're going to give you a great experience. We're going to love touching our products. They're going to be sleek. They're going to feel cool. We are going to be consistently good. We're going to do all of these things. Our differentiators, we're always going to be first with new ideas, but we're going to add something to the pot. We are going to sell you things you don't even want, that you don't even know you need. I remember, I remember my first iPod back in 2004. I remember Steve Jobs saying, imagine a thousand tunes in your pocket. And I was thinking back then, who the heck knows a thousand songs? I was wrong on that one. Yeah, people love their iPods. He sold us things we didn't know we wanted, but once we got them, we wanted more. So Apple taught us that we have to teach. We have to tell our customers, imagine, here's what we're doing next. And we always have to be leading them on to the next thing that we are doing, which, which most of your companies do already. So now branding's taking on a new look. It's taking on that you are educating people. You are moving them forward. So where am I going with the next one? You know where. It's Amazon. Amazon took all of these things and it said, we're going to give you what you want, but we're going to give it to you when you want it now. And so they started with this Amazon Prime and they started delivering things within 24 hours. And I bet, I bet with Alexa listening to everything I say, that someday I'm going to just say, you know what? I want a new TV and bingo, the doorbell is going to ring. It's going to be there. They're going to be able to, to read our minds because they are so customer focused right now. And so branding is gone from just being a differentiator all the way through the steps of consistency, of giving us an experience about telling us about the future and showing us what if and delivering what we want when we want it. So where is it going? Where is it going? It's going right now to the people. So, you know, especially since COVID, we've had such a focus on individuality and, and on people. And so now brands are going to be all about people because right now we are in what we are calling the culture of engagement, where we have human to human experiences. Today, customers, employees, they're bringing their emotions into the scene. They're bringing their emotions and their feelings into their purchases and they're bringing them to work with them. They're bringing their beliefs. We call them different perspectives. And so we have to learn how to listen because not everybody thinks the way you do. And we have to be open to listening and understanding and brands have to be very, very aware of the different perspectives that people have. And we have to begin to watch their behaviors and we have to begin to see and identify with the behaviors and with the experiences. So right now, Right now, it's back to the people. It's about the human to human culture of engagement. So I've been thinking about this and I, I, I've been working here in Houston um, with many of the hospitals that are here. I've been helping them. Uh, one of my programs is on boosting your energy and I've been helping them really become a little bit more resilient and helping them increase their energy. And we came up with what do people want? So this is something that's really kind of come from my whole idea of working in healthcare, but it, you'll, you'll understand it. When people work in a culture of engagement, they feel three things. They feel connected, they feel protected, and they feel respected. 
CPR, connected, protected, respected. And I think that this is what everyone wants today. We want to be connected to something bigger than ourselves. You know, if you think about people that buy their all their Apple products, you know, I just read where Apple's phone sales are increasing so significantly right now. People will wait in line to get their new phones. They've created a culture um, where people feel connected to each other. And brands are really working on doing that right now with the identity of connecting with a certain brand. So we want to be connected to something bigger than ourselves. We want to be protected. And boy, that word, think about it. It goes so many places. We want to be protected from the coronavirus. We want to, we want to feel healthy when we're going into hotels or we're staying in, in rooms. We want to feel that the areas are clean and they're protecting us. And we also want to be protected, especially at work when we have ideas and we're sharing thoughts. We don't want to be thrown into the grease. And everyone wants to feel respected. So I call it CPR engagement, where we're connected. When we're connected, we create communities. We create collaboration at work. We create cooperation. This connected piece is huge. And you know what? I speak a lot on the generations and younger people that are coming on the scene, especially in your business right now, they need to feel connected, connected to the team and connected to the company. So this computer, this whole idea of, of, of many of us working virtually, we've got to remember this whole piece of the connectedness. It's just so important. Protected protected and protected a lot of it is about trust as i said before we we want to trust our products and services and we also want to trust people at work when we create a culture of engagement it creates this trust when we feel trusted it's open our communication is open people are speaking more and people are have to listen more and i'm going to say that again we have to hear what people have to say and we have to listen to what they have to say because when we have open communications, it grows the trust. We also have to have shared values where, especially when we're working in organizations, people have to be on the same page. We have to share the values of the company. So when we're, when we're interviewing, when we're bringing new people on board, we have to really see if their values are in sync with the values of the brand that we're working for. It's interesting because when people feel connected protected and respected, they have a sense of pride at work. And right now, when people talk about their job in a positive way, this is how we are getting more people to come and work for us. It's called employee branding. Right now, with people turning jobs away, there's, there, there's, there's a challenge right now for hiring the best people. And one of the best ways that we can connect to the best people is when our team, when our employees, when our staff go out and they talk in a positive way about our company. So when people have a sense of pride, not only does it grow trust, but it grows the brand. And when we have a sense of pride, we take ownership in the job. We take ownership in what we do. And when we take ownership in what we do, we feel fully present. And so we go back to open communication. So trust Trust has a lot to it. It's, it's about people feeling part of something, people feeling heard, people sharing their values and feeling that they're in sync with people who have shared values. It's about people who are proud of where they work and we're proud of where we're working. We talk positively about it. It builds trust, it builds trust with people that are hearing us and people take ownership. So this CPR, it, it goes really deep into this building trust. And the last piece is people feel respected. Every single person, everyone wants to feel respected. They want to feel that people see their value. And so when we can do these three things, we have grown a culture of engagement. And that culture of engagement is what's growing our brand right now. So that's the business brand. And we could talk about it forever because there's so many pieces to it. Um, but I want to go into you right now. In our next hour that we have together, or close to an hour, I would like to share with you and help you think about your brand, think about how you're being perceived, and think about how you can really enhance and grow your brand right now. Because as I said before, this is the perfect time. This is the perfect time for you to maybe upgrade, uh, reboot, and maybe even refresh your brand. Because your brand is your greatest asset. Your brand helps you communicate your values and your brand is what people see every day when you walk into that room, when they see you on, on uh, virtually, 
it's what people think when they when you become president when they when they see you I love to study branding. So I've been studying Seth Godin for years right now. He's like the guru of branding. And he says that you are your brand. Think about this. You are your brand. You already have a brand. Personal branding is the unique and exclusive position that you occupy in the minds of others. You already have a brand. People think things about us all the time. And so as I go through this talk, I'm going to give you some ideas on how you can actually find out what people are thinking about you um, and maybe keep keep it or maybe even make a few changes because it's that unique exclusive position uh, that you occupy in the minds of others. We are a people, people culture right now more than ever before. So we buy products, we stay in hotels, we buy services, but we attach ourselves to the people. Um, I just did my first live gig. I went, I spoke at the Greenbrier. I'm sure many of you have already heard of the Greenbrier. Uh, I was pretty excited to be going to West Virginia and speaking at the Greenbrier. And it was interesting because their brand is pretty exclusive. It's pretty she, she, correct? So when I got there, um, our flight and, and the flight, this one flight comes in late in the evening. And when I got there, um, I was, it was interesting because I did not get the welcome that I thought from the front desk. They were kind, they were nice, but there were, uh, they were rushed. And it was interesting because as I had to get on a bus and go to my cabin at the Greenbrier, I was thinking about that and I was thinking about you. And it's so important that we connect with that very first person that we see. That is the brand identity. And I think, take this back to your teams. The first person that we see is kind of like the executor of the brand. And um, I'm not going to say anything negative. I'm just going to say that I didn't feel the love that I should have felt with the way the price of my room. Um, and I felt like, you know, they need a little bit of work on their brand identity. But, but what about you? So we buy products and services, but just remember this, we attach ourselves to people. And it's so important, it's so important because your people and you represent that brand. So think about this, personal branding is what others think and say about you. She loves her perfume, they're not crazy about it, right? You know, we may love ourselves, we may think that we're all that, you know, in a bag of chips as they say, but we've got to find out what other people see in us. We have got to be able to ask those questions. We've got to be able to be brave enough, brave enough to, um, to find out what others think. So I divided this program up into four sections. Um, and the first one is discovery. And the discovery section, if I was working with a client on personal branding, I would tell them this takes months. This just doesn't happen in an hour, you know? This is something that maybe even for some of you, you might want to get a journal. I've actually started journaling. I have one over here. And starting to write down some of the changes, the positive changes that you want to make maybe in the next 16 to 18 months as it relates to your career. Um, so this first step is discovery and it's, it's finding out about you because you can't change what you don't see. I'll say it again. We can't change what we don't see. So this, this is going to take a little bit of guts. This is about self-awareness. This is about you discovering a little bit about you, but it's also about listening and discovering what other people see and say about you. So um, I call this my segment on emotional intelligence. We're going to, we're going to really look at the right side of our brain right now. And to help you do that, I use this tool called the Johari Window. The Johari window was established back in the 50s when, when this whole idea of emotional intelligence first came on the scene. And emotional intelligence is about understanding your emotions and really kind of dealing with your emotions, understanding why you feel a certain way, maybe improving on your emotions. And then in the leadership role, it's, it's understanding the emotions of your team, of others, and helping them and guiding them through these emotions. So the best way that they did this, these guys, Joe and Harry created this Johari window. Um, they came up with discovering yourself and they divided it into uh, segments of the known self. These are the self that we know about ourselves, and the unknown self. So in the known self, we've got the open self and the hidden self and the unknown self. We've got the blind self and the unknown self. And I'm going to take you through some of this right now. So I've been doing a lot of talking right now. So now's your chance. Start thinking because you're going to be putting some of your answers of your ideas into the chat. And Jana will share them with me and with the others. 
the open self. So when I'm when I'm doing this uh, at the short course, uh, it's about the, the self that you brought with you today into that course. So your open self is the self you bring with you everywhere. It's the self that you're wanting to share with people. Um, it's the self that you're proud of. Um, it's information about you that both you and others know. So this is like peeling back the onion. This is the beginning of the brand identity and it's the open self. So my question is always, so what are you known for at work? Not at home. At home could be totally different. What do you think you're known for at work? Because you're known for something. And um, I'd like you, you don't have to put it in the chat. I'm going to ask you some questions in a minute, but think about what I'm talking about right now is at work. So what do you think you're known for? And so here are some brand words. These are descriptive words. And I'm going to give you some time to think about them. And when you find a word that's you, just put it in the chat. And you might put in 10 words. I, I don't care, a one at a time. But I want you to, see, when you see a word that resonates with you, I want you to put it in the chat and Jana will be sharing some of them. Whoops. We've got determined and trustworthy, dependable, humble, strong, ambitious, Wow. Um, focused, analytical. Interesting. Disruptive, <laughs> ambitious, Disruptive. driven in, focused, spiritual, hardworking, positive, helpful. Interesting. Generous, playful, and trustworthy. All right. I love it. We're hearing several trustworthies. I think that's, that's interesting. We tapped into something. Professional, friend to all, generous, positive, cooperative. These are wonderful words. Yeah. Um, what, what my suggestion is, if I was working with you one-on-one, -on -one, is to pick four or five of the words you want to be known for um, and put them, um, some of you are artistic. You can make, you can make a, a portrait of them. You can make a, a picture of them, but they need to be somewhere that you see them. Um, especially when you're doing a virtual program, sometimes people forget to bring their personality um, on, on the camera and we don't see anybody's face. We can't make connections if we don't see you. And so this whole idea of, of bringing these words forefront will really help. Live by these words. These are the words, whatever you write down, and you may have other words of what you want people to say about you when you're not there. Uh, what you want people to say when they're describing you to a new hire. Oh, she is very trustworthy, very fair, um, very honest. She, I have, I, I'm going to talk about boundaries later. They might want to say she's got, she's got very defined boundaries. Um, she's adventurous, determined, whatever the words are. I think this is your opportunity to pick the words that you want people to say about you. And this is the beginning. This is the foundation of your brand. Okay, I've got to move on. This is the known self. Um, the hidden self is interesting. The hidden self is the self that we, we don't share. For many of you that are in leadership roles, um, right now people have emotions that they're bringing with them into work. They're saying that leaders with really strong emotional intelligence become much better leaders right now because like we said, people are bringing their emotions and their perspectives into work with them. So this is a time for us to be a little vulnerable. This is a time to share the truth. I'm gonna say it again for many leaders. This is a time to share the truth. This is a time that you might want to share some of your emotions, some of the, some of the things that you had. So I was working with uh, Memorial Hermann here in Houston when they were going through the highest, the, the peak of the pandemic. And I only worked with the leadership team. So I was talking to the head of nursing and she said that, um, she was bringing her nurses in one on one and she had a big chalkboard in her office and she wrote down emotions. And these were some of them. I took this from her chalkboard and these were some of the emotions that they were feeling. And when people would come into her office, she would say, I want you to circle two or three of the words that you're feeling today and let's talk about them. 
And it was a great way for her. She said that she grew her team. She said so terrifically because they all had a chance to talk the truth and to get out there. And many of them said, I'm going through some burnout. And they figured out ways to give them a day off. They figured out ways to help them get through some of their fears. And I think today we've got to think about that. I was just working with, I'm working with a company right now where the team is all millennial leaders and I'm working with them and they're bringing in a lot of new hires that are Gen Zs. And I said to me, to share with me, share with me some of the struggles that you've been through and what you learned from them. And I said, now take those stories of your struggle and how you persevered and came through them and share them with some of your team. Because when we can begin to share some of our hidden self, we have such an opportunity for growth, especially in leadership roles. Because the hidden self, many of it, we're storing our fear and our anxiety and our doubt about ourselves in there. And when someone that we respect can say, you know what, I felt that way too. I have felt that way many days and I work through it this way. We help people grow and we help them and we grow our personal brand. The next self is interesting. It's the blind self. It's information about you that you don't even know, but everybody else sees it, you know? Uh, like, am I really like that? So I, I thought I'd play this, even though um, you'll see what it's, it was, it was someone and it was in Grey's Anatomy. So I was, I was getting ready for the hospitals, but it's interesting because it's someone, it's, it's a leader asking one of his teammates um, what she sees in him. So you have to have thick skin when you ask people, but let's, let's take a listen. Do you think I'm too confident? No. Don't lie. You are my boss. All right, then. Anything you say in the next 30 seconds is free starting now. I think you're cocky. Arrogant, bossy, and pushy. You also have a God complex. You never think about anybody but your damn self. But I, but what? I still have 22 more seconds. I'm not done. So I hope yours doesn't turn out like that. But feedback is a gift. Be strong. Ask people that you respect. Take them to lunch and say, tell me what you see in me. Tell me some of the qualities so that we can begin because that is who your brand is. And if we can begin to listen and take this feedback as a gift and work on, work on some of the areas that we don't see, work on that bl those blind spots in our blind self, we are going to grow our brand exponentially. So, um, so that's, the, uh, the, uh, that's the unknown self. So I came up with these four questions and I'll tell people, take these four questions. And if any of you guys want my slides, I can give you my slides at the end of this. But um, take these four questions and maybe email, email some people that you respect at work and say, you know, I've been working with a coach. That's a great way to do it. And we'd really like some, I'd like some one word answers, one to three word answers on what, not what one word describes my personality. Brands have personalities. Find out what people see in you. What's that one word? For me, I thought it would be humor. I, I was thinking so much, but for me, it was high energy and energetic personality. I had no idea that people saw that in me. Um, and I did that at the very, very beginning of my speaking career. I would ask people what they remembered about my speech and it was my energy. I That was a blind spot for me. I had no idea. So many times your blind spot can actually be a compliment. It can be an attribute. It can be something that really is part of your superpower. Uh, my energy is my superpower. I had no idea. And now I use it in a positive way, but I wouldn't have really known that if I hadn't asked the question. The next one is what value do, do you most closely associate with me? Brands have values. So what do you see? Is it family? Is it relationships? Is it success? Is it education? What values do you see in me? What skill or talent comes to mind when you think of me? This is a great one to ask your boss. You know, what am I good at? What do you see that I'm good at? Because what we do, what people see in us, that is our brand identity. And for many, I will tell young people this, present, get up on stage, get up in front of your group, give a presentation, be known for something, get your name out there, practice speaking, because this is the best way to grow your brand. And the last one is, how would you describe me to others who have never met me? 
this is how you're going to find out how people perceive you. So these are the awareness questions and um, I use them all the time. And like I said, email these to people, say you're working with a coach and see what you get. Because remember, your brand is what others see and say about you when you're not in the room. So that was discovery. That was number one. That was the first piece of it. And it, it, it takes the most time because it's, it's getting in touch with yourself. The second part of the brand um, is design. So if we were a company, you know, it would be it would be your logo, it would be your website, it would be all of the visuals. But we're going to take design in another way. A design when we come to branding is how do you show up every day? How do you show up vir virtually? How do you show up every day face to face? How do we show up? And it's it's sure it's it's a lot of what we wear, but it's also it's also our attitude. It's also our uh, positiveness. It's also our energy. So the question is, how do you show up? Every day when you go into work, you have a choice to make of how you're going to show up. Think about the customer, think about your, your teammates and show up as a benefit to them. Opinions are formed about us in seven seconds. It's interesting. Um, today, we're forming opinions so quickly about people. So think about that. Uh, think about how you're, how you're being perceived. A lot of this, uh, I started listening to this TED Talk. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Amy Cuddy, but she did a TED Talk, and it's like the second most watched TED Talk of all of the talks. And it's about what our bodies say to people. Um, you know, I think many of you years ago, maybe you learned about the handshake and the power of the handshake. It, we learn about sitting erect, walking into a room, standing up straight rather than slumped over. So our bodies, our shape, just the way we show up physically says so much about our confidence. It says so much about our energy. It says so much about our brand. But Amy took it one step further. She said, in order to grow our confidence, so this is all about our heads right now, she said, we're going to look at our own bodies and our brains are going to decipher it. Your body language shapes who you are. This is what she said. She said that our minds, or excuse me, our bodies change our minds, our minds change our behaviors and our behaviors change our outcomes. So what does that mean? That means that when you're looking at someone, you know, I remember this when I became a speaker and they said, well, if they're slumped over or if they're looking down, they're not interested or if they've got their arms folded. So many times you're looking at people and your mind is talking to you. Your mind is saying, oh, they're bored right now. They're not interested They're And so as you're communicating, your mind is chattering. I don't know, maybe do you have a voice in your head? I have an entire committee in my head. I have voices going on all the time. Like, look at that one. Don't no, look at that one. Look at that. So I got to shut them up. But think about it. Your mind is always talking to you. It's telling you what, how you think people see you, how, how they're feeling today. Your mind is reading them. Well, she says that your mind is also reading your body. So when you're like this, when you're, when you're closed off, her research says that your brain is shutting down. It's saying that you're bored, you're not interested, and it's kind of taking away your energy. So your bodies change your minds. So she suggests that we open up. She suggests that we sit straight at our desks. She suggests that we always open up because the more open we are, our minds say, oh, you're happy right now. You're, you're excited. So our bodies change our minds and our minds change our behaviors. So when we're opened up, she said, we're much more friendly and our behaviors, how we show up changes our outcome. So those are her, those are her principles. So they studied blind people and they noticed when blind people were happy and jubilant and they were crossing the finish line, they were studying athletes, their bodies opened up. When your body opens up, your brain says, man, you're confident. So I tried this because sometimes I have to stay behind a stage before they announced me, especially with larger audiences. And I was sitting there always kind of closed off to myself. I was a little bit nervous, but I was just sitting there. I didn't want to make a noise. And what I realized was I was telling my brain that I was fearful. So I started practicing what Amy said, and I started opening up. So I started walking around backstage or behind uh, the audience, and I opened my body up and it energized me because it my brain told my body that I was confident. So what I thought I would do right now 
is I would have a little intermission here because I've been talking for 45 minutes. So I want you right now to get confident. So I want you to get up out of your seat. I'm gonna give you a little bit of time. I want you to either stand up and I want you to do the Wonder Woman pose or you stay in your chair if you want. And I want you to do the Rocky pose. And I want you to just, this is our intermission and our stretch. And I want you to tell your brain that you're confident. Everybody stretch. So how do you show up? Show up with confidence. If you have to give a speech before you go into work, stand at your coffee pot and give yourself the power woman pose. And then maybe even go into the restroom and do a Rocky pose. Or if you're asking for a raise for sure, get that energy up. Everybody will know that this is your day to ask for a promotion and get your, get your body in motion because your mind is telling your body that you're happy and it will change your outcomes. So walk into room, stand up straight and show up in a positive way. Step number three is distribution. How do we get the word out about you? And distribution is an easy one because uh, we've got social media. So a lot of, we put a lot out on social media, right? So think about what you're putting out because that right now is growing our brand quicker than anything else. Put positive things out about work. Put positive things out about your teammate. Put positive things out about the company. Put positive things out all of the time. It's just a way of growing your brand and it's also a way of growing the brand of your organization. Put quotes out there, but keep the brand positive. So many times people get into, as, as we know, um, disagreements on social media, stay away from anything that's controversial because your brand right now is really being developed on, um, on Facebook and, and Instagram and all of the social media. But there's something that uh, I'd like you to do. If you want to do it right now, you can. I want you to take a moment and Google yourself. I think that people um, are missing the point of how to grow a brand. And if you Google yourself, I don't know what you'll find, but for many of us, the first thing you're going to find is your LinkedIn profile. Think about that. Your LinkedIn profile is what's going to show up first. I want you to begin to think about this is the most phenomenal way to grow a brand. And so many of us, oh yeah, I did it a couple of years ago. I haven't looked at it since. I've heard so many people say, I totally forgot about it. But when you Google your name, which is what people will do, they will Google you, what you want them to see is your LinkedIn profile. And what should be on that LinkedIn profile? Well, number one, it should be a great photo of you, not a little one. You know, did you ever see the ones where their people's photos are really, really tiny or they've got their photo with another person in their family? We want just a photo of you and we want it to be where we can just see it from the shoulders up to the head so that they can identify with you. So go out there and put a new profile picture up that looks like you and then take time, maybe over the weekend and complete your profile 100%. Make it updated, complete your profile. In your summary box, it needs to be clear of what makes you different. Here's a chance for you to put what you enjoy about work. What's your favorite thing? Tell a story in there about something that you do and what you enjoy the most. Maybe even promote your company if, if that's what you would like to do because it will grow your brand. Um, think about the value that you can bring to an organization by just saying things like, um, I enjoy, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy learning. I enjoy working with the new hires. Think about the things that you enjoy and put them in it as it's your story. Be interesting. Don't make it like a resume. I think that so many of us, we, we want to read it. So tell it more like a story. Spend some time on that profile and make it interesting and make it uh, interactive.
And what I mean by interactive is sometimes when you're out there and you're putting in posts, ask people questions and answer people. I think that sometimes we just keep it stagnant and we don't respond. Maybe we're putting things out there, but take the time on a regular basis to interact with other people because your LinkedIn profile is the number one way that you can grow your brand uh, on social media. And it's one that people forget about the most. So we think about social media, we think about how we get the word out about us. This, this is one way by upgrading our profile. The other way is by getting off, getting off our devices, getting off our devices and meeting people face to face, meeting people face to face, having lunches with people, um, taking time out, having a cup of coffee with people or going on Zoom. And instead of having a phone call, try to meet with them on Zoom so that we can, you can see them, so that you're looking at them, so that you're, that you're engaging with them. For a lot of the people in, in my course, when I'm, doing, when I'm doing it live, a lot of uh, the people that come to the short course, um, they're just starting in leadership roles. And so we talk about the levels of how we create a business relationship. And one of the things is to be self-aware of how people are relating to you. So I put this in here for, uh, for many of them because it helps them. This is like a clue as to how you're connecting, how you're connecting with your, with your team, with your, with your boss even, and also with, um, with new hires and people that may be beneath you. So number one, um, the levels of a business relationship. Level number one, they see me, but they don't know my name. And, I, and I'll give an example. Your boss walks by and he goes, good morning. And he nods, right? He doesn't know who you are. You know, hey, or you say hi, and you maybe you pat him on the back. We don't know your name because we're not saying. So why why is it important to say your name? Because it lights people up when you say a person's name. Good morning, Karen. And you say, I didn't know they knew me. They know me. They know my name. It's it's a gift. Okay, it's a tremendous gift. So think about this. Think about this when we're going when we're back at work, and think about this when you're bringing new people on the team. Think about in the morning when you're walking by someone, say their name, say their name. That's the first step in the relationship, because when you say their name, it's going to light them up. Then you might ask them something. You might be friendly. You might say something to them. You might just say, it's good to see you today. Just any, any comment. So we say their name and then we say something. Once we say something, now we're added to it. Boy, we're, we're doing so much more because now we go, hmm. They notice me. They like me, you know? So now it's a positive. It's a positive. Great to see that big smile on your face or something that's very positive about the person. It will, it will matter so much, okay? Remember, co connected, protected, respected. It's one of the C's. You're connecting. Then you might ask them a question. You might ask them about their kids. You might ask them how their weekend was, but you've got to listen. You've got to stay long enough to listen. Then as it goes in, you might begin to ask them a question about work. You might begin to ask them something else. So now we're getting into the relationship a little bit differently. And now we're asking a question where we want the answer. Because when someone asks you your opinion and they ask a question, all of a sudden we go, they're listening to me. They're asking me my opinion and they're listening to me. These rank really high in creating a business relationship. This is what young people need to hear when they start into a company. They need to know how to engage, how to connect, how to begin to form that relationship. When someone values your idea, remember it, take it to heart, don't dismiss it. This is really important. When we've given someone a suggestion and they say, it's a great suggestion, I'm going to try it out. Own it, listen to it and own it because in the end, when we can become someone's trusted advisor, we have made it, we have hit the, the pinnacle of business relationships. So when we talk, when we talk about growing the relationship, it's steps, it's knowing people's names, it's taking the time to ask them questions because we can't start a relationship. We can't just jump into it. We have to begin to take the baby steps. And so these are the levels of how we can connect and how we can grow our brand. Phew, I've been talking a lot. Hi, ja hi Jana. <laughs> the last part of this is the delivery. It's, 
you got to do this every day. This isn't something like you can't work on your brand. You can't work on it one day. This is something that has to be consistent and it has to be consistent with people. This we're going back to how brands were. And I said, it's all about people. It's all about connecting. It's all about people feeling trusted. All of this is going back to people. And so my last step, of course, because I love them, um, is going to help you gain the competitive edge right now. It's going to be, how do you work? How do you deal with people? And so for me, it's always going to be about the generations, whether it's that that traditional that's coming into your hotel or going to your conference, um, all the way down to that brand new hire or that intern that's a Gen Z, all the steps in between, all of the people in between are people that we have to deal with. And right now, each one of these groups of people is bringing their own perspective into work. Their expectations of a good job may be totally different from each other. I want you to think about this right now. People are bringing their beliefs, they're bringing their perspectives, and they're bringing their experiences into work with them. They're bringing their experiences into the cust- as the customer. So you've got the customer and you've got the employee. So this is just really an interesting piece of branding. How do we connect with each of these generations? So we've got five generations right now. It's interesting because I thought my work was over with the generations and it's just beginning again. I'm getting so many requests to talk about understanding millennials and Gen Z. And millennials are turning 40. It's, it's not like they're kids anymore. So it's that younger millennial. So it's, it's really understanding people that are in their 20s right now and how do we motivate them and how do we inspire them and how do we keep them at work? So what I'd like you to do um, is, I think my next slide, Well, let me go through them really quick. We've got traditionalists between the, I'm going to do the ages first, between 1922 and 1945, baby boomers, 1946 to 1964. These are their birth years. Gen X, 65 to 79. Millennials, 1980 to 96. And Gen Z, Gen Z, we're not sure on the dates right now. We're thinking 1997 to 2012. so my next question is, so put in the chat, what generation are you? Let's see with, the, with those that are listening. What have we got? A lot of Gen X's, so millennials and boomers. So do we have any Gen Z's? No, I haven't seen one yet, no. All right, so we've got probably the bell curve with mostly Gen X. And you know, Gen X, I love you. <laughs> I, I say so many great things about you. You're fine. You got quite a few of millennials in here too. Yeah. Okay, good, good. All right, here we go. So there's the word. I can say the word because I believe that we all have, we all feel that there's a bias against our generation. I've got a double whammy. I'm a baby boomer and I'm a Karen. I got them both going on, guys. I'm being honest with you. <laughs> So I don't care. I just listen because I sometimes I totally agree with the biases that are out there about my generation because sometimes we don't listen. Sometimes we feel we know everything. Um, but this is a time for us to realize that, the, that we have got to open. We've got to listen because we're going to learn from every generation, from experiences to ideas to new ways of doing things. So I'm going to give you some clues. Um, I think I want you to think about the gender, especially when you're interviewing and you're working with your new, with your team. Um, there's some questions that you can ask. Age, age differentiates us. We're not going to ask you your age, but so that's one way we already went through that, but there's a couple more ways that we can really determine what a person's thinking. And one of them is their parents. So if we think about the parenting roles, you know, the parents of the baby boomers were my way or the highway, the parents of Gen Xers, Gen X, I'm going to really uh, generalize here, but parents were busy, baby boomer moms and, and, and traditional moms were going back to work, they were going into real estate, um, they were going to work or they were volunteering and the kids were left alone. So the parenting style for Gen X, the parents were kind of laissez-faire, let the kids do what they want. Um, And from that, we got the most creative of all the generations, Gen X, because we left you alone. 
Um, the parents of the millennials, it started now we're getting into more of the helicopter parents, where parents are starting to really be on, you know, in part of the kids' lives, a part of their social life. And now we're looking at, it's interesting, Gen Z, and the parents of Gen Z are Gen X. The, they're saying that the biggest difference between Gen Z and millennials are the parents because Gen Z is much more pragmatic. It's much more realistic. Um, and so a lot of that is coming from different parenting styles. So as Gen Z takes more and more roles in the workplace, we'll study that a little bit more. But your parents, your parents um, and the way you were parented has a big effect on, on the way, uh, way you get things done. That's when we, well, I'll get into Gen X in a little bit. And then the last piece, well, then technology plays a huge role in it. If we think about technology and we think about this generation coming up, this Gen Z that was born with technology, we realize that we can learn from each other. And the last thing to look at is what are the defining events that happened in their lifetime? And right now, all the studies are saying that COVID, we've all been affected by it. Don't get me wrong. But COVID is going to be the event for Gen Z. It's the event that prevented weddings, graduations, kids went back to school, were homeschooled, they were schooled through their computers. So they will be the generation that really is affected the most, the most by COVID. All of these things define a generation. So when you are talking about Gen X or when we're talking about millennials, we can begin to see how the world changed because we are really affected by the, the, they say the formative years, the years of age eight through age 20 or 18, right around in there before you go off to college. Those are your formative years. And that's when a lot of who you are is developed. And a lot of it has to do with your parents, technology, and the events that are going on. So it's not just about your age. So um, we've got the baby boomers. And, and right now, um, we have baby boomers in the, in the audience. I would say the generation that is changing the most are the baby boomers. You know, they've had to go through right now with, with technology and with the new ways of doing work, I feel like they have probably made the most changes. Um, there's still a lot of baby boomers around. There's 71 million. Um, they're a very optimistic generation, hardworking, very, very optimistic, adaptive, and very self-focused. And so we're going to see that whole idea of the baby boomer being self-focused going on to the way they raise the millennial children because most of the baby boomer parents um, are, are, are parents of millennials. And so it's interesting because this is a generation that was highly competitive, um, hard workers, very competitive because there were so many of them and the world really wasn't ready for them. World War II ended and boom, lots and lots of babies. So right now, this is a generation that is leaving the workplace and when they leave, all of that experience will be gone. Many baby boomers, this is, this is really interesting, were the foundation of many of the organizations that you work for. And so with their 30, with their 40 years of experience, they're taking that with them. So we've really got to um, get a history. We have to really debrief them. Um, and we've really got to begin to understand some of the experiences that they have had before they leave. But I've got to move on. Um, when Gen X came on the scene, 1965, um, and through the 70s, it was an interesting time because women became very independent. And so this is a generation that they say was left alone. This is the generation that they call the latchkey kids. Uh, I hate that word, but, but, but it really means that there was, there was not a lot of supervision. It's a generation um, of most of the Apple. Uh, if you think about the Johnny Ives of Apple, uh, most of the engineers of Apple are, are Gen X that brought Apple to where it is now today. Of course, there are lots and lots of millennials. But in the beginning, this was a generation that um, did not fear failure. I'm going to say it again. They were innovation came from failure. So this is a generation that figured out how to do things. And many times it didn't work and they would figure it out again. They have more patience for trying things. Um, think about it. Think about this generation because younger people today have a strong fear of failure. But this generation, if we're talking about innovation, they understand that this is where great ideas come from. Um, it's a generation that doesn't like a lot of chit chat. Um, they have been called very direct. Many of them have been called blunt. So their communication style is a little bit different from baby boomers who are talkers. Uh, Gen X likes to get the work done and they're highly goal oriented. 
So now I, I just read where 65% of the CEOs in the United States are Gen X and they don't care where you work. They just want to get the work done. And so they're very much about productivity. They're very much about getting the work done. And they're very much about, they don't care where or how you get it done. They just want the work done. Um, it's an interesting generation. <clears throat> it's an interesting generation. If we had more time, I would talk about them because right now these are the leaders. Um, and so I want you to remember this whole idea of failure because this is a generation that understands innovation and they understand that you have to stumble, correct yourself. They say fail fast, learn it, fail fast and move on. Um, it's interesting because Gen X, because of your communication style, and if we were if we were able to talk, you might be able to talk to me. But because you are a little direct, um, and because you want things done um, efficiently, uh, Gen they just did a, a, a study on Gen Z, and they don't want to work with you. They want millennial bosses. They do not want Gen X bosses. They do not want baby boomer bosses. So younger people feel much more comfortable with millennials. So we'll kind of get into the power that millennials have in managing. But I've got to leave. I've got to move on. So we've got millennials right now. Millennials, you changed the workplace. You've changed it. It's interesting because I would give you credit. I will say that Gen X brought in innovation um, and creativity, and you brought in this whole idea of purpose. Um, and so you've got the heart, you've got the heart. Um, you were taught well by your parents, you look for your career development. And so I want you to think about this. I want you to think of all of the things that are important to you. And I want you to help this younger generation coming up. They want you to be their leaders. And so your brand, your identity has to be one of a coach. Tell them your stories, tell them how you made it. Give them ideas and share your success stories with them. And I think when I talked about this in the beginning, when I talked about um, the hidden self, talk about your struggles with younger people and how you overcame them. They will be like a sponge and they will listen to you. So you've got a great role in this leadership picture of becoming more of a coach. And these kids that come up, they're bright, um, but they're going to need your encouragement. And they're going to need your ideas. And so um, I'm counting on you. I'm counting on you for that and growing your brand. Oh, I'm going to move on to the last one. Let's go to Jen. Oops, I put this in here. Who remembers this? Think about it. Remember when you said, I'm going to go download something. Let me go mow the lawn. It's going to take three hours. Think back to what we've been through, many, many of us, you know, especially Gen X. Gen X, you are, you've been through, you've, you've been through both. You had uh, analog and then you also had the digital. You're kind of like the bridge between all of this because you can still remember when we had to go up and touch the TV to change it rather than a remote. I mean, we can go all the way back to the phone and the party line and how today, if you walk out of the house without your phone, you will go back and get it. I don't know how far back you'll go, but most of us cannot live without our phones. The world has changed. And this is a generation that's coming up. These will be your next new hires. These are going to be the people that will be coming to the short course in 2022 and 2023. They don't know a world without it. And so how, remember the formative years are between the ages of 10 and 18. So you've got to begin to think about what they're going through. And they are going to be very, very, very different. I don't know what the workplace will look like, but I know that will, it will have to have a heart. It will have to have a heart. They say that right now, they, it started with brawn and then it went into brains and now we're going into having a heart because they're going to have to feel connected, protected and respected. So this is a generation right now that is what we've seen of them because they're, they're in their 20s right now. They're, they're in their early 20s. They will change just as millennials change. The, the uh, older millennials are very different from the 30 year old. The, the, the 40, 40 year old is very different from the 30 year old. And this generation will evolve and it will change. And we will, we will watch them as they grow. But what we're learning about them is they are very much about the finances. They want money. Um, they will work an extra job to, to get, to make more money. They're very, very financially focused right now. Um, and they're, they're concerned. They're worried about their work. They're worried about if they if they'll be laid off. So they've got so many challenges right now, but right now 
with the way we're hiring, selection is a two-way street. This generation is going to ask you questions, HR. They're going to want to know all about your values of your company. So uh, just two or three years ago, we were asking all the questions and they're now coming back and they believe that they have, uh, that they can select where they want to go, especially the ones that are, um, that are the high achievers. So think about this when you were talking about in an interview, when you're talking about your organization, it's a two-way street. They're going to ask questions and they're going to have to make the selection. And so are, are you. So they're looking for flexibility right now. And I know for many of us, we have to be at work every day. We can't work from home. This, this is not an option. Our jobs require us, especially in hospitality, to be there. But they're going to look for flexibility wherever they can see it. I was just working with a, a company who, um, who all of these people own asphalt companies. And they said it's really hard right now to hire young people. They don't want to pour asphalt. And they don't want to work 10 and 12 hour days. So they're having to change their shifts. So they're working in shifts of six hours rather than 12 hours. So they're finding new ways to be flexible. But I think the number one way that you can attract the talent is to tell them all the benefits, all of the positive things, all of the things that they can learn and grow from your organization because they're gonna be looking for that. So when we work with young people, and we're in a leadership role. Sometimes, especially when I was working with the short course, um, people would come up to me and they would talk about their challenges for boundaries. And so um, I believe that we have to have, we have to respect our work ethic and our values. And I'm not saying be flexible and change your standards. I'm saying you've got to really get clear on your boundaries and what's acceptable and what isn't. And I thought the best person that could really talk about this with you is Brene Brown. So I'm gonna play this piece for you because I want, I want to empower you to realize that you're setting the standards of how people are going to work and they're going to be looking at you. They're gonna be looking at your brand and how you're, how you're performing. Let's listen to what Brene has to say. One of the most shocking findings of my work was the idea that the most compassionate people I have interviewed over the last 13 years were also the absolutely most boundaried. Because most boundary. they, so I'll give you a great definition of the, the, the definition of boundary that I use in the book. Boundary is simply what's okay and what's not okay. What I think we do is we don't set boundaries. We let people do things that are not okay or get away with behaviors that are not okay, then we're just resentful and hateful. Me, I'd rather be loving and generous and very straightforward with what's okay and what's not okay. Um, and I did not, I, that I learned from the research. I was the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. I, I assumed for the first 35 years of my life that people were sucking on purpose just to piss me off. Mm -hmm. That's what I assumed. Um, that. Yeah, right. Whether it was someone who worked for me or it was someone who, family member who was constantly like, I was always critical and judgy. And I was like, why are they choosing these things? Why are they making their choices? They should know better. And then when this thing came up for my therapist, what if people are doing the best they can? I thought my husband had the most beautiful answer to that question. He said, I'll never know whether people are doing the best they can or not. But when I assume people are, it makes my life better. So now I think I am not as sweet as I used to be, but I'm far more loving. It's not just some like technique so that you can do that. That's really like a way of being to like nurture that soil of wholeheartedness. Or yeah. Whatever. Generosity to assume the best about people is almost an inherently selfish act because the life you change first is your own. So Brene says, and I really like that. It's, it's about setting boundaries. It's about assuming that people are doing the best that they can. She also goes on to talk about a compassionate leader and people who are compassionate, people who have a compassionate brand. When you're working with people and you're assuming they're doing the best that they can, you take time to show them how to do it even better. So it's not just 
telling someone you're doing okay, you're doing okay. And then boom, you let them go. It's, you know what? There's, I'm going to help you do this even better and taking the time. It takes time to be compassionate and compassion is an action and it takes time. So when we're working with people and they are doing something and they could do it better, we assume that they're doing the best they can and then we help them do it even better. So when we're working with people, as we be curious, ask questions, ask questions and listen, begin to try to understand people's perspectives so that you can really relate and connect with them better. Um, so I, I'm going to end it. I'm going to close it down with something that's fun. I learned this from millennials. Millennials really helped me um, be much more interactive in my keynote. So I'm, we're going to play a game at the very end. And here's how the game works. I think the next slide. Um, I've picked some TV shows that relate to the generations. And there's so many lessons you could learn from watching these shows. I'm going to play a theme song from a, a, one of the shows, and I'll tell you which generation. And put your answers in the chat, and let's just see how many you get right. The first slide, I can't remember, how did I do this? So the first slide will be the music. So don't put it in. The second slide will be the answer. So I'm sorry, put it in when we hear the music, and the second slide will be the answer. So here we go. Hope you can hear it. This is about baby boomers and how they solve problems. What have we got, Jonna? Law and Order and Hillside Blues. Hill Street Blues could have been good, yeah. but, it, but it was Law and Order. It was Law and Order. That was a good one. Okay. Sorry, Hill Street Blues. Okay. Here's the next one. This is about Gen X kids riding their bikes. If you want to learn about Gen X and the 70s, watch this show. Do we have it, Jonna? Stranger Things. You got it. Let's see if I've got it. Stranger Things. How many said? Did a lot of people get that one? Uh, three. Okay, good. Here we go. Here's the next one. Sanford and Son. Yeah, yeah, a ton of people that knew that one. Oh, good. All right. Here's the next one. Maybe. Okay, we all should get this one. We just had a reunion. It was the introduction to Generation X, and um, they've turned, they've all turned 50. And uh, it was like, it's the most watched show, I think, on all of Netflix, right? How many, did anybody not get friends? No, it looks like they all do that one. All right. <laughs> So it's interesting to watch it and to see what life was like back then. It's a sliver into Gen X adults. This is a hard one. It's Gen Z. It's... You got somebody yet knew it, yeah. Somebody knew it, all right. A couple people, yeah. All right, all right. Well, I'll tell you at the end. Okay, Rick and Morty. I've never heard of it. My son said you've got to put it in there. Um, it's kind of like a, a weird back <laughs> to the future. Anyway, it's Gen Z. I don't know. Something to watch. I hope your workplace isn't like this. It's the office. They say that the office right now is taking over. Uh, more people are watching the office than friends. So it's, it's going to be a close second. Of course, everybody got that right. All right, here we go. This is where you get to sing along. I won't hear you.
It's the Fresh Prince. I'm sure everybody got that one. Life is a Gen Xer. And here's the last one, taking you back a little bit. And it's Charlie's Angels. Charlie's Angel. I, I did that one for the hairdos. So anyway, if you got them all right, if you got them all right, I think there'll be a few we've got with them. Just email me at Karen at Karen and I will send you my book, Generations Rock. So if you got them all right, I'll send you my book. So I'm going to close it down with a quick story. And the story um, is my personal story of... I started speaking in 2000 and it's, it's interesting because um, I, my career kind of took off and uh, it was doing okay. And then in 2008, when the world closed, similar to what's going on right now, all of my work was canceled. Uh, everything was canceled and I had a totally empty slate. And um, this, the social media was just coming on the scene right then. I, I knew nothing about social media. Um, but I wanted to learn how to market. I wanted to learn how I could use social media so I could do some marketing. And there was a 23-year-old African-American named Crystal Washington, who was quite a big deal here in Houston on the Facebook. Uh, maybe some of you have heard Crystal speak. Um, but back then, she was helping uh, small businesses learn how to use social media in their business. And um, I gave her a call and I said, let's meet for coffee. I'd like you to teach me. And she said, you know what? I would like to become a speaker. And so we got very, very excited. We decided that we were going to co-mentor each other. And we created a course called Social Tunities, teaching all the associations here in Houston the value of using social media to market. And we did live presentations. So every week I helped her on stage. I taught her about speaking. Um, we are best friends right now. Uh, she's quite a bit older. And uh, she is an international speaker. She speaks all over the world on, uh, on technology. And it's interesting because I just put a picture of the two of us up there. Every single thing about us is different from our age to our race. And she's my best friend. And my advice, my advice to you is to include people who are different into your life and into your friendships. Because when, when you know somebody on a different level, you will learn so much more. You'll learn about their beliefs. You'll learn about their perspective and you will grow your brand. Thank you guys for having Karen, me. We have, a, we have a message here. Um, somebody asked, actually asked that people say, stop caring what other people think. How do you better handle those types of hurdles when you're trying to grow yourself? People say, stop caring what other people think about you. Yeah. While okay. you're trying to grow yourself, how do you deal with that? I can be really honest with you and say something that um, when I started speaking, a lot of my friends thought that I was a self promoter <laughs> because I had to promote. I, I heard negative things many times about me getting into this career. And I've learned that you take the ones you have to let things go. If things are being said about you, like you said, I, this person is taking things to heart, you have to decide where, you, where your goal is and you have to make that decision for yourself. Not everybody's gonna tell you you're great. So you have to be very selective on the people that you bring into your circle that help you grow. I've, I've learned it, I've learned it and I, I can tell you that you have to be kind of, you have to define those people that you want to be your mentor, so to speak. The good, that was a really good question. On the road to success, you will have people that will hold you back. Excellent advice, Karen. Well, first off, let me just give you a big round of applause along with everybody else that I, I imagine are, are watching. Um, you all can see that this is just a small snippet of what we get at the court course. And you, know, you will be uh, receiving the same thing in person um, come January when we're back to a full schedule. And Karen is, is one of our top speakers, top topics, and we look forward to having her there. And keep a look at your inbox for the uh, next um, series webinar and the date for the official short course. Thank you again, Karen. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Jonna. Always, you know that. Oh, it's a lot of talking. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, but you're always so good at it. You always bring so much energy to it. So thank you so much, Shauna. Always. Bye, everybody. Bye, sweetheart. Talk to you later.